You may or may not know that ASP.NET Core sits on top of Kestrel. If you've never heard of Kestrel or you were slightly curious but never explored it, you're in luck. In this video, we will explore where Kestrel sits inside the ASP.NET Core framework. We will touch it a little bit closer and we're also going to answer the question of whether you should even care about trying to build your own ASP.NET Core or your own web framework on top of Kestrel. My name is Anton, welcome to the Rock Coding YouTube channel. Please don't forget if you're enjoying the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Go ahead, visit the links in the description. Let's go ahead and get started. Here we have three projects, all of them are really small. First of all is the controllers project where we map controllers and then we have a home controller with just hello world. Pretty much the same thing is happening on the endpoint site. We have one endpoint with hello world. Now these two projects are essentially our baseline. The reason these two projects are here as the baseline is when we worked with MVC and controllers, We've seen how going from that to endpoints, we've seen a massive, well, maybe not massive, but we've seen a performance boost. Now, if you are aware of ASP.NET Core, the framework, which is sitting on top of Kestrel, the server, you may think, well, there is this bulky framework in the way. What if I take this framework and I just throw it out the window and I create my own very, very minimal endpoints on top of the Kestrel server, right? The story sounds a little bit like minimal APIs. So with that said, we have the Kestrel extension project where we are going to be working on actually exploring where Kestrel is and how it's built. So the first thing that you really want to understand is you're going to run your application. It's going to try to execute a server or set up some connections under the hood. So the first thing we want to do is we want to go into this run function. We are going to hook for a URL and then we're going to keep going down to the run. On the iHost interface, we're going to again trigger the run async function. We're going to go down to this function. And here the important thing to note of two further functions. So the first one is start async. We're starting the server and then we're waiting for shutdown async. And this is going to be relevant a little bit further on. If we go further into start async, we're going to end up on the function on the iHost. We will then want to go to the implementations of start async and look for host because web application is an adapter or a wrapper class around iHost. The host class is the actual thing, the implementation that will then get passed into web application. Now the host itself will have the start async function and under the hood, we are going to find that it's trying to surface instances of I hosted service interface. So if you've ever implemented a background service, this is the same interface. On the individual iHosted services, we're then going to call start async. So here we're working with the iHosted service interface. But we'll then go even further into start async and here we're going to find a couple of implementations. Now, background service is what you implement if you need a background service. Data protection hosted service, I'm not quite sure what this is. I know that we need to go into the generic web host service. And that is specifically if we come back to program CS, when you're creating the builder, when you're builder under the hood, it's going to be using a generic web host builder to build this service. Now, if you've been following along and you're already lost, you don't know where you are. Don't worry. All you need to understand is that a bunch of stuff gets set up over here. And by the end of it, we're going down the chain to the Kestrel server to run it. So in the generic web host service, we have the iServer interface. If we look for the implementations of iServer, we're going to find the Kestrel server and Kestrel server implementations. Now Kestrel server implementation is the actual Kestrel server and Kestrel server is a wrapper around the Kestrel server implementation. So implementation is internal to the ASP.NET Core framework. Kestrel server is something that we can use. Let's go ahead and take the Kestrel server. We're going to come back to program CS and we're going to close all of the tabs except the Kestrel server. Here we're going to go ahead and create our server. So Kestrel server and then we're going to start looking through the parameters and slowly filling them up. We're going to import missing references. In the Kestrel server implementation, we want I options of Kestrel server options. So as the first parameter, let's go to the options class and we're going to create default of new Kestrel server options. We'll then put a comma and then inside Kestrel server options, we want an I connection listener factory. 
if we look for the implementations of this class, there is only going to be a single one here. Let's go ahead and grab it. We'll, we'll say new one of these ones, import the references, and the last parameter to the Kestrel server is iLogger Factory. If we again take a look at the implementations, there is either a logger factory or a null logger factory. So null logger factory is basically a no operation implementation, and that's what we're going to be opting in for. So null logger factory over here. The socket transport factory is looking for options and the logger factory as well. So we'll just give the same things to it in the constructor. And there we have an instance of the Kestrel server. Again, if we go down the run and to run over here, run async and then into start async and then the implementation host down to start async of the hosted service and generic web hosted service in the start async function over here. And again, I'm just going to close everything so we have the generic web host service available so we can keep coming back to seeing how it's actually starting the server. So if we go down, 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 and a little bit further down on the server, we're going to see start async and what it's passing into the start async of the server is some kind of application, a hosting application. Let's come back into program CS. And first of all, we'll go into server. We're going to start async semicolon on the end. And then we want two things, the whatever and the cancellation token for the cancellation token. I will just pass none. And then for the second thing, if we come back into the generic web host service hosting application, if we go look on the interface, we have this. This is made up of three parts. We have creating a context and the T context in this situation are the things that you want to capture around your application and the HTTP request. So it's like an amalgamation of an HTTP context in the context of your application. It's like the overall context of what is currently happening. Setup method, we create the context, we process the context, and then we dispose of the context. And these functions are going to be called by the Kestrel server. So when a Kestrel server is going to receive a request, it is going to pass around these context features into this interface. So then the hosting application, the thing that implements this interface, what it's really doing is it has a bunch of services injected into the hosting applications. It then surfaces an HTTP context, puts it into the overall host context. So right over here, and this is all during the setup. So it makes sure to grab the HTTP context and put it onto this overall context. And then processing the context, if we take a look at the underscore application, what it actually is, is a request delegate. If you understand ASP.NET Core middleware, you know that this is middleware. This is your use endpoints, use authentication, use authorization. This is the middleware chain. Whatever you're setting up, the HTTP context gets pushed into there right here at this process request async. And then finally, you have the dispose context. Now, the reason you have setup and dispose in the ASP.NET Core framework is you can imagine that it's going to be making many and many requests. One of the most crucial things that are being set up in these three methods is object pooling. So if you imagine if there is a new object for each individual HTTP context to your web application, you're going to be creating and destroying many HTTP context objects. So the hosting application is leveraged here for performance optimizations. Otherwise, it's not doing anything too complicated. Let's go ahead, grab the interface. It is implementing some kind of class. We are just going to create a new public class HTTP app, and we're going to implement the IHTTP application. We don't have a context. We can create one. So public class context, whatever we are capturing. Let's go ahead and pass it here. Let's make sure we import missing references and then we're implementing the interface, all of the three functions. Again, this stuff does not need to be complicated. We can get rid of the dispose context because we might not be doing any optimizations. None of that process request. This is where we can start adding some simple processing of the incoming HTTP context. Otherwise for the create context, this is where we want to surface the HTTP context and actually put it on the context over here so we can process it then. 
So first of all, we want to have a property of the HTTP context. And by the way, HTTP context comes from Kestrel. HTTP context does not belong to the ASP.NET Core framework. HTTP context belongs to Kestrel. Let's have our HTTP context right over here. By the end, we are going to return a new context. Notice how this is not asynchronous. And when we're returning the new context, we want to be setting the HTTP context. Now, I'm not going to bore you with how you find out about the default HTTP context and how you can pass context features into it. And it's going to go through some default setup. By the end of it, you can have your request context, HTTP context request. You can then have your response, new context, HTTP context response. If you ever used a Node.js Express, we're essentially in the same situation where we have to do something along the lines of this request path equals, and we say that it equals to slash. We will go to the response body. And first we're going to get a writer. So new stream writer, put a request body inside of there. We're going to need a using. On the writer, we're going to write async, hello world. This will turn our method async and we're going to need an await on our using statement over here. Response status code can be set to 200. Otherwise, if we do not hit any routes, we can say that the response status code is 404. So page not found. And there you have it. This place is essentially if you would be building your own web framework or you're trying to strip away ASP.NET Core, this is where the bulk of your work would be happening. We can now take the HTTP app, place it into the start async, and we're ready to go. Well, uh, almost. If we open up the terminal over here and we run, our application is actually going to run because I've not removed any of this stuff. So we're actually stopping over here and we're never really executing the Kestrel server. I'm going to comment all of this stuff out because I'm going to need to return to something in just a second. You will see that our application just finishes. If you remember that on the app run, when we are running the application right over here, run async, we have start async and wait for shutdown async. After we start the application, we actually just want to wait for it for a little bit. Let's remove all of this stuff and create a shutdown promise. New task completion source. All we have to do now is just await on shutdown task, semicolon on the end. And now if we run the application, it will just be running and then we can also cancel it. There might come a question of where is the Kestrel server actually running? Like what address, what IP? You can set that through the Kestrel options. As with many things, you pass something into the constructor to configure it. Nothing different here. So these are just going to be options and on options. We're going to say, listen to any IP. And here we can just provide a port like 5001 take the options, pass them through, provide a little bit of space. And let's go ahead and rerun our application. It may seem like it's hanging, but it's not. Uh, let's go ahead to localhost 5001 and we're going to get hello world. Now, this is as far as we're going to go. We don't need to go too far to figure out whether building on top of Kestrel is a lot more beneficial than building on top of endpoints. So the main reason why you'd want to build on top of Kestrel is to strip away the ASP.NET Core framework that you would think is bulky or something like that. So the main reason to do it is basically performance. So how performant is it? Is it faster than minimal API endpoints? Let's find out. Here we have the three applications running, uh, the Kestrel server, the endpoints and the controllers. Here I'm going to be executing these K6 scripts. So one for controllers, one for endpoints and one for Kestrels. The only real difference between them is that they're pointing to different endpoints. I will leave a link for K6 in the description. I'm pretty sure you could maybe use scenarios or something like that over here. If you are more familiar with K6, go ahead and leave me a comment. Let's go ahead and give this a try. I'm going to run all of these from one terminal. I'm going to cut the videos and display the results on screen. So first of all, let's go ahead and run the controllers. With controllers, we managed to achieve around 1.22 million. Let's go ahead and try endpoints. Here we managed to achieve 1.36 million requests. Not a crazy performance boost, but it's still pronounced. We can then execute our custom framework on top of Kestrel. So Kestrel JS. And the result lands at around 1.36 million. 
So not that big of an improvement from the 1.36 million of the minimal APIs. So in the grand scheme of things, ASP.NET Core may seem like this massive bulky framework. However, if you try to go to the core, if you try to throw it away and just use Kestrel directly, it is not going to be that much faster. So in the end, is it worth building your own web framework on top of Kestrel? Definitely not. Minimal APIs are actually sitting to the Kestrel server a lot closer than you think. So by the removing ASP.NET Core, you're not getting much in return other than losing a bunch of tools that are already there available for you to use. This will be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. If you really enjoy my work and want to say thank you, please come support me on Patreon. Get the source code. A big thank you to all of my patrons that are already supporting me. Your help is very much appreciated. Hope you're having a good day and see you in the next video.